All right, well, it's a few minutes after seven. Um, so we probably ought to go ahead and get started with the program. Uh, it's the November meeting of the Central Arkansas Astronomical Society. Looks like we've got 20 people participating. So our numbers are kind of going up as we get more used to using Zoom for meetings. Um, we um, generally don't carry out a lot of business at these meetings. We have presentations usually from members, sometimes from guests, as we did at our last, I think it was our very last meeting, where we had uh, some people from around the country join us and, and one give a presentation, which Bill Hartcock gave a presentation. Um, one of the things we usually do in November is announce nominations for officers. We elect officers at the December meeting, which is our annual club meeting. I don't have those ready yet. I still need to uh, talk with Steve Block, who I haven't connected with and trying to, to uh, get his input on who we ought to nominate for offices. Steve is the immediate past president. Um, Daryl as vice president, and I as president form the nominating committee and make a suggested slate to the club. And then we do take nominations from the floor. So, Within the next couple of days, I'll get that distributed to the club by electronic mail. And uh, with that, we have two presentations tonight. One from Joe Musgrove, who's a pretty new member just a few months in, I think. And he's hit the ground running. He's already been out and repaired the deck at the uh, observatory and has uh, volunteered to give the Constellation of the Month presentation on Orion this month. And then Dr. Tony Hall, who uh, is at UALR and has helped the club tremendously over the years with various things, is going to make a presentation tonight on the evolution of stars. So uh, Chris already turned over control of Zoom to Joe and, and Dr. Hall. So I will uh, turn things over to you, Joe, and go ahead and give your presentation. Thank you very much for volunteering to do that. Well, great. And, and certainly, um, in, you know, enjoyed doing it um, and hopefully you'll enjoy tonight. A couple of things, this is a, a video presentation. Um, so you might notice, depend, since this is going through Zoom, uh, depending on your connection, there might be some lag in the video time, uh, but shouldn't, shouldn't really affect the overall presentation. However, if anyone has any, any problems with it or wants to go look at it later, um, I've mailed the group, just the YouTube video if you wanna do that. Um, second thing, thing before we get started, um, there was a slight typo um, in the script when I was getting the presentation ready. So you'll hear me say um, a couple of times, all to knock, but it's actually, as everyone knows, all in the talk. So um, don't go looking for another star in Orion's belt. <laughs> the spelling is correct. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and start the screen sharing here and get us going. The Orion Constellation, one of the most recognizable constellations in the night sky. The name was given to us by the ancient Greeks, Orion, the Great Hunter, born of Medusa's sister Uriel and Poseidon, god of the sea. But man has been observing Orion long before Greek mythology. Cave paintings as old as 35,000 years depict this hunter of the night sky. With a lineage of gods, some of you may be having second thoughts about leaving home and visiting the Great Hunter. Perhaps visitors are not welcome, but if you're curious like me, the journey is worth the risk. Perhaps Orion is proud of his treasures in the night sky and welcomes visitors to share in the wonders of the universe. But before starting a journey, it helps to know where one is going. So how do we find Orion? First, we must start our journey when Orion is home. As our journey is starting in North America, Orion is visible to us from late fall through early spring. Starting in late October, about an hour and a half after dark, look to the east and you will see Orion starting its climb over the horizon. 
eventually reaching its highest point in a southern sky. But with so many lights in the night sky, how does one recognize the Orion constellation? We are in luck. Orion is one of the most easily recognized constellations in the night sky. The most recognizable feature, and a good place to start, is to look for a group of three stars in a straight, almost horizontal line. This group of stars is called Orion's Belt. The star marking the left of Orion's Belt is called Altanach, a 1.88 magnitude star 800 light years from Earth. The middle of Orion's Belt is marked by Alnilum, a 1.69 magnitude star 1,342 light years from Earth. And finally, we have Mintaka, a 2.49 magnitude star located just 916 light years from Earth, which marks the right side of Orion's Belt. If we look upward from Altanak, we can spot a red orange star that marks Orion's right shoulder. This star is called Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse ranges in magnitude from 0 to 1.6 and is 642 light years from Earth. Looking south from Altanak, we can spot Safe. Safe is a 2.09 magnitude star, 720 light years from Earth. Looking upward from Antaka, we see Bellatrix. Bellatrix is a 1.64 magnitude star, 244.6 light years from Earth. Looking south from Antaka, we can spot Rigel. Rigel's magnitude varies from 0.05 to 0.18 and is 860 light years from Earth. Our journey begins. The first stop in our journey is Rigel, and as we approach, we see Rigel is more than a point of light in the night sky. Rigel is massive. A blue supergiant, 21 times as massive as their own sun, and 79 times the diameter. If her sun were the size of a dime, Rigel in comparison would be roughly the size of a volleyball. But as impressive as Rigel is, it has already moved off the main star sequence. Despite being a young object in our universe, 8 million years old by some estimates, Rigel has depleted its hydrogen and has entered the end of life phase. Sometime within the next million years, Rigel will go nova, ending its life as a black hole or a neutron star. Our next stop is Betelgeuse, the red-orange star that marks the right shoulder of Orion. As we approach, we stand in awe. Even Rigel appears small compared to this massive red supergiant. Betelgeuse is 700 million miles in diameter and is 20 times more massive than our own sun. If Rigel were the size of a baseball, by comparison, Betelgeuse would be the size of a beach ball. Our own sun would be a mere speck compared to Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is a cosmic example of living fast and dying young. A relatively young star, less than 10 million years old, Betelgeuse is a rebel. A renegade star that was ejected from its birthplace close to Orion's belt, the star is estimated to be traveling at 30 kilometers a second and has created a bow shock four light years wide. But despite all its attitude and show, Betelgeuse is a dying star. Sometime in the next 100,000 years, Betelgeuse will go up in a supernova, finally ending its life as a black hole or neutron star. In typical Betelgeuse style, it will make sure its death will not go unnoticed. The supernova will be visible from Earth becoming the brightest object in the night sky, 
and even visible during the day for a time. Our next stop is M42, or commonly known as the Orion Nebula, 1,344 light years from Earth. Located just below Orion's belt, it is the middle point of light on Orion's sword, a cosmic wonder made up of gas, dust, and stars. Unlike Betelgeuse and Rigel, which represent the end stages of life in our universe, Orion's Nebula represents birth and a new beginning. Inside the high density areas of nebulas, gas and dust come together to form bigger and bigger clumps. Eventually, these clumps collapse under the weight of their own gravitational attraction. During this collapse, if enough heat is generated in the core of the collapsing cloud, a prostar is formed. Many of these prostars will go on to form new stars. Around 700 stars in various stages of formation have been observed in the Orion Nebula. As we take a step back, we realize the Orion Nebula is just one part of what is known as the Orion Cloud Complex. This great complex extends throughout the entire Orion constellation and is home to other nebulas to include the famous Horsehead Nebula, the Flame Nebula, and Barnard's Loop. The time we have left on our journey is growing short, at least our perception of time aboard our spacecraft. But we still have time to visit two more wonders of the Orion constellation, Bellatrix, marking the left shoulder of Orion, and Safe, marking the right knee of Orion. As we pass by Bellatrix, like Betelgeuse and Rigel, we see Bellatrix is also a large star, 8.6 times more massive than our sun. Bellatrix is also older, 25 million years old by some estimates, old enough for the giant to have exhausted its hydrogen and begin its journey toward a violent end. Our last stop is Safe, another giant 15 times more massive than our own sun and 20 times bigger in diameter. Safe until recently was estimated to be about 11.5 million years old, but more recent studies suggest it may be much younger, 6.2 million years old. But even a few million years makes no difference in Safe's condition. Like the other massive stars we have visited, Safe is estimated to have exhausted its fuel of hydrogen and will eventually go nova. It makes one wonder, in just a short time in cosmic terms, one to two million years, what will the Orion constellation look like? Our time is up. I hope you've enjoyed our journey. As we head home, I hope your interest in the Orion constellation has grown and you will take time to visit this wonderful location in our night sky. Okay, hopefully that was came through. Everyone could see it here okay? Nope. It, it sort of overwhelmed Zoom. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> did it? Uh, it? It's an impressive production. I'll give you that, man. I tell you, that's, that's the highest class uh, constellation uh, program I think we've ever had, at least when I've-, <laughs> I've right, been, Thanks, um, thanks. <clears throat> But uh, my, my question is, what's what? Where? where what does wagging tails mean? <laughs> well, I, I've actually I've got three adopted dogs, um, and so kind of a dog dog person. So that's kind of where that name came from. Um, any anyone have any questions or anything um, about the presentation or Ryan or? Yeah, how long did it take you to make that? Um, I worked on it about a week and a half. Um, I have a, a program called uh, Movie Maker, um, which is kind of good for YouTube presentations and different things like that. And of course, the you know the research and, and things that I did, um, and uh, you know, so it uh, learned a lot about Orion on the way. A lot of stuff that I, I did not know. So, um, but it was fun to put together. You know, I, I kind of enjoy you know, doing things like that. Thank you for doing it. Yeah, really you bet. Appreciate. You bet. That's great. Well, if no more questions for Joe, uh, 
Let's move over to Tony's presentation. Okay, I'll um, share my screen. Like I said, I'm gonna be talking about stellar evolution, the life and death of stars. It turns out, uh, coincidentally, uh, these two presentations are going to uh, go very well together. <laughs> um, as uh, they stated earlier, I'm Dr. Tony Hall. I'm an associate professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Now, when we're studying stars, they change very little over a normal human lifespan. So we don't have the ability to look at one star and watch what it does. However, what we can do is observe many stars and look and see how all these different stars compare and from that develop a life cycle. Um, and, and this is something like if you want to study the life and death of a human, you could look at one human from the time they're born till the time they die and develop um, their life cycle. Or you could just go to the mall or sit out somewhere and people watch. And you will see all the life cycle of human beings walk past you. Um, and so by seeing stars in all of these different places in their evolution, we can put together how they get there. And not to mention using computer modeling and stuff, we, we can actually kind of detail um, some of what happens in between. And here I have an HR diagram, which is uh, an astronomer's main tool. And on there we can plot, let me, um, I'm gonna bring up a laser pointer right quick, I think. So can y'all see my laser pointer? Yes. Okay. So when we plot the temperature of a star versus its brightness, we see some patterns come out. One of those patterns is this big main line here called the main sequence. And it turns out that if you were to look at 100 stars, about 90 of them on average would line, lie on this main sequence. That's where stars spend 90% of their lifetime. So that's where you're going to find 90% of stars. And then we have stars that are giants. It turns out they're relatively cold, um, three to 5,000 Kelvin, but extremely bright, meaning they're very, very large. And down here, we have very hot stars. 10 to 30,000 Kelvin surface temperature, but virtually invisible, really, really dim. This is in solar luminosities. Um, and that has to do with the fact that they're extremely tiny. Now, the primary factor that determines what a star will do as it lives and dies is its mass. Mass determines its lifetime and how it lives and how it dies. Now, if we look at the mass distribution of stars, we see that stable stars are between about 0 0.08 and 150 solar masses, although most stars lie between 0.2 and 2 solar masses. Um, the vast majority of stars are relatively small. Um, nature finds it much easier to build a bunch of little things than one or two huge things. So most stars are, are relatively small. Now, there are things that limit the size of a star. It turns out that stars can't get much more than about 150 solar masses. I think there are about three or four that are known on the order of about 200 solar masses. So there's some detail in them that we aren't gonna go over. Um, but most stars, or at least uh, population three stars, hydrogen stars, uh, tend to be about 150 solar masses or smaller. Uh, that's because as they're being born, as they're developing, they get so hot, so bright, that after they get about 150 solar masses, they can actually blow um, other mass away from them. So it basically shines itself apart and blows any other mass away to basically self-limit their size. Now, there are stars that go down to 1% the mass of our sun uh, to about 0.08 solar masses, uh, but those aren't very stable. They're brown dwarfs, they have limited fusion, they kind of go on and off. Um, they're very cool, very long lived, but they're not what we would consider very stable stars. 
And any star less than about 1% the mass of our sun is essentially a planet. It, it just cannot sustain any kind of fusion process. It can get hot from gravitational collapse, but it doesn't get hot enough to sustain fusion reactions. Now, just for some size comparisons, I showed you some of the, the mass ranges out there, but just for some size comparisons, in number one here, we see Mercury, Mars, Venus, and Earth. And if we kind of scale Earth down and put it here, we see Neptune, Uranus, uh, Saturn, and Jupiter next to them for some size comparison. And then if we take Jupiter and put it on this scale, we see some stars in comparison. And this is the relative size of our sun, and there's uh, Sirius. If we were to make Sirius this size, then we can see some of our other stars, Pollux, Arcturus, Aldebaran. Again, scaling Aldebaran down to right here, we can start to see the relative size of other stars. There's Rigel, Antares, um, Betelgeuse. Uh, coming down here, we see some of the, I think um, this Canis Majoris is the largest uh, star, not necessarily largest mass star, but largest physical size star um, that we've discovered. But you can kind of see the range there of star sizes. Here's our sun uh, uh, next to Sirius, um, and, and they get dwarfed at, at every step here. So there is, is a larger range in star sizes as there are in star masses. Now, to begin with, most stars begin their life very, very similar. They begin as a big gas cloud, but out in the universe, most gas clouds are, are, are cool and very thin. They're, they're very spread out. And because of that, gravity just isn't that strong and gravity can't pull that mass together. E even though it's relatively cold, not moving a lot, everything is just so spread out, gravity just can't pull it in. But if some other process happens, maybe a nearby supernova, more often than not, it is a young, hot, bright, ultraviolet star giving off so much energy, it can actually push this gas into dense regions. And we see this is the Eagle Nebula over here. And this is a cavity that we see, and this is if I were to take a basketball and basically lop off a little piece of it and peer inside the basketball, that's what the Eagle Nebula is like. And inside the basketball, we see these as these pink stars here are these hot ultraviolet stars that are generating so much energy, they actually push this dust cloud. And that makes the dust the, the clouds of gas more dense, which allows gravity to start taking over and start collapsing it down. And if you notice right here in our Eagle Nebula, this region right here is blown up in this photograph, the pillars of creation. And what will happen is it will push on this gas. And anywhere the gas isn't very dense, it just gets blown away. We can think about this if you sprinkle a little bit of sand on a tabletop and blow it, um, a lot of the sand will blow away. But if you ever develop a little clump of sand, a little blob, it'll protect. It's heavy enough that it doesn't move easily. And it kind of shields the, the sand behind it. And um, this happens in physical geologic processes called um, hoodoos. Um, I think there's some in the uh, southwestern United States, and it's basically soft dirt with a hard rock on top. And weathering, rain, and wind etch away at the soft rock, but that hard rock on top protects the softer rock underneath, and it makes columns, much like we see here in these pillars of creation. And at the top of these pillars, now it's hard to see in this photograph, but there's a pillar there, a pillar there, and a pillar there. That's one, two, and three of these pillars. Um, the tops of these are very dense. 
And next to them in this region, the, the gas cloud has been blown away, but this dense region has been left behind. And those form eggs, evaporating gaseous globules. And they're basically very dense regions where gravity has taken over and is holding this mass together, preventing from further evaporation, erosion. And gravity starts to collapse it. And you can see some of these forming, especially if you blow up um, these pillars of creation. You can see regions where these little stars are starting to pop out at the edges. And you can see some of these regions. I mean, if you blow up these regions, you can see the very tips of some of these are starting to glow. And that's that protostar starting to pop out. And so... Um, these stars form out of these huge gas clouds. And this is one huge gas cloud. And just this one region right here is forming all of these different stars. Now, Tony, the Eagle Nebula Tony, is about... Yes? What's the E stand for in eggs? Eggs evaporating. Okay. Evaporating gaseous globules. And, and it's, it's basically the... Um, the, 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 the um, the star, the protostar, basically starts to um, blow away the envelope. And, and basically, it's like the chicken uh, breaking its eggshell out. Um, and so gravity makes the egg, but then the protostar inside the egg essentially evaporates the shell, leaving the star behind so that it's visible then. Um, it's very hard to see forming stars because they're usually encased in that cocoon, um, that shell of gas um, that's held there by gravity. But the protostar can't blow it out away until it gets strong enough, hot enough, and, and emits enough light. And so a, a single gas cloud can form many, many stars, um, large Large groups, star clusters, can form out of these large clouds as well. Um, and, and this Pillars of Creation are one of these stellar um, nurseries. And we see more in this. This is one of the pillars here. And this whole region around there is just one large star-forming region. Now, the Eagle Nebula is about 50 by 70 light years. So this is an immense region of space. Um, our next closest star is four light years. So you can imagine there's going to be a lot of stars formed in this general region. So I'm going to start with the evolution of low mass stars. And like I said, they can form, start out from an interstellar cloud. Something pushes it, makes it get a enough dense density that gravity can take over and start to collapse it. And as gravity collapse it, collapses it, um, these newly forming protostars quite often emit these bipolar flows. And that's because when something is falling in and orbiting, it is most energetically favorable to leave out the poles. Things don't want to try to leave out the disk. It's just not easy. But it's a lot easier to be emitted out of the poles. We see that with black holes, accretion disks, neutron stars, um, th that is just a, a physically, um, energetically favorable way to leave a system. And of course, once these stars get big enough and hot enough, they can initiate helium fusion in their cores. They can actually smash for or, um, not helium fusion, hydrogen fusion, smash four hydrogens together to give rise to one helium atom. And the release of that energy is what powers our sun and holds it stable in a hydrostatic equilibrium. Now, eventually that stops. Eventually the core where it's hot enough and dense enough to fuse hydrogen, the hydrogen runs out. And so now I have a helium core that's collapsing. And of course, when gas falls, it speeds up. And in physics, we call that getting hotter. And so as the gases warm up as they fall, this helium core gets hotter and hotter, which causes the hydrogen above it to ignite. 
So instead of having, say, a main sequence star like our sun is burning just hel uh, hydrogen, a giant star can actually burn hydrogen and have a hot helium core that's collapsing, giving off radiation. Now, eventually, the helium will ignite. Um, it gets close enough, it gets hot enough, gets dense enough that helium ignites. And I kind of form a new quasi-stable star. For ours, it will be a, a yellow giant because of it'll have a, a helium fusing core and a hydrogen fusing shell that's generating the energy to hold up the outer layers. But because it's fusing in the core, it is quasi-stable. As long as a core has few, as long as a star has fusion in its core, it is somewhat stable. Um, but eventually that runs out. And when that runs out, our star starts to look like this in the center. And I have this huge shell of hydrogen gas. And inside of that, I have a ring where hydrogen is fusing into helium. And that helium falls into a region where it's hot enough that helium fuses to form carbon. And for our sun, this is about where our sun will stop. It, it deposits that carbon into a core. And of course, since it's not strong enough or hot enough to fuse carbon, that carbon's collapsing, warming up. So I have a, a hot core, I have helium fusion, I have hydrogen fusion. All of that is producing energy. All of that is blowing out on these outer layers. And it causes those outer layers to actually start pushing out. So after what we call the red giant phase, where I have all of these different um, layers burning inside or fusing inside of my star, those outer layers can get pushed on so much by the all the engines on the inside that it actually pushes the outer layers of the of the star off. That hydrogen shell actually gets pushed off of the star. The star is so big that gravity just has a hard time holding on to those outer layers because it's just so spread out. And so what I'm left with is the star core. Okay, that carbon core that was at the center, and we call that a white dwarf. And then we have this expanding outer shell of gas, that's the outer layers of that star that's getting pushed out, called a planetary nebula. Now, during this time, when a star first starts out, the gas cloud is very cold. So it's way over here on our HR diagram, and it's really dim. So a gas cloud starts out on our HR diagram, basically off the screen. But as it warms up, it gets hotter, so it moves left. It gets brighter, so it moves up. And a star like our sun will then land on the main sequence, burning hydrogen. It runs out of hydrogen and starts its death phase, if you will, starts to burn helium, runs out of helium in the core, turns into carbon. And during that phase, our sun gets colder, moves back to the right, but gets brighter because it gets bigger. So it moves diagonally up into a red giant. And then after those outer layers get pushed out, our sun kind of wiggles down here to a white dwarf, that carbon core that's left over. Now, this is a pretty standard procedure for most stars below about five solar masses. Um, depending on how much mass is ejected during that planetary nebula phase, um, it kind of limits how big the core can be when you're left with a white dwarf. A white dwarf can be no more than 1.44 solar masses. So as long as these stars can shed enough mass during that planetary nebula phase, the core will just settle in as a white dwarf. Uh, now, planetary nebulas, they're some of the prettiest objects we look at, right? Um, here's a, a sample of a few of them, cat's eye nebula, the helix ring, butterfly, glowing eye nebula, all these are planetary nebulae. And quite a few of these, you can see that central core left over. 
Now they glow because that central core is so hot. It is giving off large amounts of UV light and UV light can energize all the gas that's in the outer layers that are getting pushed away and causes them to re-emit light uh, depending on what atoms are there. So we see hydrogen lines, we see um, helium and various other um, atomic spectral lines in these outer layers due to this gas basically being heated from the inside, that core that's left over. Now, planetary nebula tend not to last very long. They're, they're virtually uh, a, a blink of the eye in, in the lifetime of a star. A star like our sun lives for about 10 billion years and the planetary nebula phase lasts between one and 10,000 years. So it's essentially a blink in the eye, a blink of the eye in comparison to the lifetime of these stars. The red giant phases, a little longer, can last anywhere from 100 million years when we're in that semi-quasi-stable helium burning core phase um, to just 100,000 years as it's going through those red giant phases as, as those outer layers are getting pushed out. Now, next we're gonna deal with massive stars, uh, stars bigger than about five solar masses. And these stars, they tend not to be able to shed enough mass to keep the white dwarf where it is. Now, the bigger a star starts, the bigger the white dwarf is. And as um, hydrogen fuses into helium, helium fuses into carbon. If my star is a little bigger, it can fuse carbon into oxygen. If my star is a little bigger, it can actually fuse oxygen into neon, I think. Um, and, and so depending on how big the star is, that white dwarf will end as something. Our sun will end as a carbon core, they believe. But if our sun were a little bigger, if it were two or three solar masses, it could burn carbon into oxygen and we would end with an oxygen white dwarf. Now, like I said, most stars are below two solar masses. So the vast majority of these remnants, these white dwarfs are carbon core white dwarfs, just because most stars are on the smaller end of that scale. But as I get bigger than that, as my sun approaches five solar masses, I turn oxygen into neon and neon into silicon and silicon can turn into iron. But all of this starts the same way. I start with a huge glass cloud. Something lets gravity take over. It can be a supernova explosion nearby that sweeps this gas into a dense region. And of course, the protostar forms, just like before. We get these infalling glasses, gases, the bipolar jets form um, as mass tries to escape from the system. And eventually I have hydrogen fusion and I have a main sequence star. These main sequence stars eventually, like every other star, runs out of hydrogen and then we'll start to burn helium and it'll eventually run out of helium and start to burn carbon and so forth. And so as my giant star ages, I get a different look. Giant stars are like ogres, right? Because ogres are like onions. They develop these layers. And so on the outside of my star, I just have a relatively cold ball of hydrogen gas. I say relatively cold, 3000 Kelvin. But inside of that, I have hydrogen burning into helium. Inside of that, I have helium burning into carbon. Inside of that, oxygen uh, being created. Um, there, there, there are several different layers here. I didn't put them all in. You can have neon and silicon. Now, down below in this chart, I kind of showed some of the temperatures required for these processes. Um, and the time it takes for these processes. For a very large star, like 25 solar masses, it may only have a stable lifetime of about 7 million years. These very large, massive stars 
live their life process very quickly. Gravity's a lot stronger. It can make things hotter. It can get things closer. So everything happens quicker. But eventually, and the key point is, eventually in these more massive stars, my silicon fuses into iron. And that's what makes the difference. Once my star is big enough to fuse iron, a different process can happen. I don't just blow the outer layers away now. Once I create iron, nature will not fuse iron. Um, iron is on, uh, in the grand scheme of things, one of the more stable um, atoms and elements. So nature doesn't want to make things bigger than iron. That's its favorite. So once nature makes iron, it stops, which means there's less energy being created on the inside of my star. So not as much as pushing out. So all of these layers, burning hydrogen into helium, burning helium into carbon, burning carbon into oxygen, burning oxygen into silicon, and burning that into iron, all of this pushes out on the star, but I start turning those off because my core will not heat up any further. And once that happens, once I quit pushing out on the star, the star starts to fall in. And once that happens, we get a supernova event. Now, you can kind of demonstrate a supernova event if you've never seen one before. You can make one at home, get a basketball, put a tennis ball on top of it, and then drop them. And just dropping a basketball from chest height with a tennis ball on it, the tennis ball can go many meters into the air. And that's from the bounce of the basketball um, putting that energy into the tennis ball. And something similar happens in our core of our star. All of these outer layers start to fall in. Now, the inside layers are heavier. They're like the basketball. The outer layers are lighter. They're like the tennis ball. And when they come in and fall and hit that iron core, the iron core is like the floor. And these heavy inner layers bounce off the floor and throw all of that energy into those lighter outer layers. And all of these outer layers go rushing out at really high speeds. And that's what we call our supernova. Now, depending on the exact processes, the exact the, the mass of these stars, um, they can turn into either a neutron star or a black hole. Um, <coughs> I said the mass limit for a white dwarf is 1.44 solar masses, the Chandra Shikhar limit. The, the mass limit for a neutron star black hole is a little less well known. There's a lot more that goes into that. But neutron stars can't be more than about four solar masses. Any larger than that, they would form a black hole. So depending on how much mass is ejected during the supernova, that'll tell us what we're left with after this explosion. Now, for a very large solar mass star on our ATAR diagram, again, we will start way off to the right and down because we have a very cold, dim gas cloud, and it'll, it'll move way up here for these massive stars. They're much hotter because gravity is making them uh, fall much faster Fast means hot in physics. Um, and then as it runs out of hydrogen, it'll start to drift this way. The outer shells uh, drift off and they get cooler. And my star will just kind of bounce around up here a little bit as it's creating these new layers, as it's developing new cores, right? Every time it runs out in the core, a new core will form and push the old core out a little bit, burning a shell. And then my new core will collapse until it ignites the next layer. And when it runs out, it pushes the old core outward and develops a new core. So as, as that continues to happen, the giant stars kind of bounce around up here and eventually go supernova. Now, here are some images of supernovas. Casse and Crab are probably uh, two of the um, best well-known uh, supernova events. 
And all of this gas are those outer layers that got ejected. Now, something cool, when our universe was formed, it basically only built hydrogen and helium. That is about all the early universe can make. And in our early universe, that's it. Nature would rather build many, many small things than one large thing. So nature doesn't want to build iron at the beginning. It doesn't want to build uranium during its initial phase. It would rather build hundreds of hydrogens than one uranium. And, and so really the only thing our universe was built or, or born with, our primordial um, atoms, were hydrogen and helium. They burn those lighter elements. They create the lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen in their cores. And when those cores basically blow out those outer layers, those new elements get blown out into the universe. So low mass stars basically give rise to the lower uh, uh, or the smaller um, atoms in our periodic table. Now, larger stars burn heavy or fuse. I, I say burn in the vernacular because students tend to get that better, but fuse into heavier elements. They have more gravity. They can pull things in closer and create heavier elements. And in their lifetimes, while they're burning and fusing, right, they can make up to iron. And and so these high mass stars during their lifetime can make elements up to iron. But after they, they live and they go through their supernova event, all of those elements get blown out into the universe. And so our universe gets aluminum and iron and uh, manganese. These are all generated in the high mass stars but blown out into the universe during a supernova event. Now, everything bigger than iron, however, cannot be created in a star. A star will not create anything larger than iron. If it tried to create something larger than iron, it would actually cool itself off and prevent it from trying to make anything else. So it's a self-regulating process. If you could make something bigger than iron, you shut the process down so you can't make anything bigger than iron. So where does everything else come from, right? Naturally, we can make in our universe everything up to uranium. That's the largest naturally occurring element. So where does all of this come from? right? Um, that came from the supernova event, not the star itself, but when these outer layers get ejected, I can actually take silicon and smash it into other things and make elements much heavier than iron. Um, and so all the other elements greater than iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, gold, silver, um, all of you have a super piece of supernova in you. Um, so um, all of us were born from the ashes of these older, um, larger stars. And so our, our stars recycle our elements and then re-interject re them into our universe. Now, like I was saying, mass is the most important thing in determining the evolution of a star. Low mass stars kind of die with a poof, ejecting that planetary nebula. While pretty, it's not very powerful. They just, the outer layers just kind of drift away when all things are said and done. But the high mass stars, they die with a bang, a supernova explosion. And in both of the, these events, those materials that were in the star that are getting created in the star, that are getting created in these events, the supernova event, all get thrown back out into the universe. And remember I said that you may have a gas cloud floating out there in space, but gravity can't do anything with it. 
but maybe a high mass star nearby goes supernova, ejects all of these heavy elements or um, uh, throws out all of these heavier elements out into the universe and they collide with that gas cloud, that cold gas cloud that gravity can't do anything with. But when that shock wave and the material from the supernova hits it, it can push it together, make it more dense, and let a new star form. And then those blow up, creating a shock wave that can collapse more gas clouds, causing more stars to form, throwing more uh, material back into our universe. So both or all life cycles of stars recycle material back into our galaxy. And of course, that being said, we are all made of star stuff. Right, the, the iron in our blood was once in the core of a star. Um, the gold that is in a ring or necklace, that happened in a supernova event. And that gold was created in a nuclear reaction that then got thrust into a gas cloud, causing it to collapse, collapsing into our sun. And some of that material got swept up by our Earth to, or swept up to form our earth, and hence, we have access to gold. So I'd like to thank you for listening today. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Yeah, Dr. Hall, I was kind of curious. I know, like, these materials um, that exist, I mean, they're, they're created in, in a supernova explosion. So is it necessarily all these materials are created in an explosion, or is it just sort of a, a luck of the draw? Like, Say, for example, I'll just throw something out there like a supernova. You know, you have a supernova and maybe gold, for example, is, is, doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, is not produced. Is that, so is it a given that all these elements are produced in a supernova or is it just sort of a by chance sort of thing? Um, it, it is by chance, but, but the, there are, are so many atoms that a little bit of everything will be created. Now, the details... Um, may govern how much cobalt versus how much silver is created, right. but almost a little bit of everything will get created. I mean, we're talking um, an impossibly large number of atoms, right? We got a, say, a 25 solar mass star made up of, <laughs> you know, a few, you know, collections of protons. And so um, just a little bit of everything gets created. Um, the, the ratios that gets created can depend because some stars are, are, they're called population three stars. They're basically nothing but hydrogen. Um, those are the earliest stars that formed in our universe. They are made out of just the stuff that was created in the Big Bang. But then there are stars that formed later in the universe that formed from the ashes of other stars. Those are population two stars. They have some of this stuff in them because a star somewhere lived, died, blew up and scattered its ashes into another gas cloud, which eventually collapsed. And so now when that one dies, it's going to take what it had and make more. And so it's just a kind of a, a growing effect um, as we go. It is thought that our sun is a third generation, that our sun was created after, in, in this region, there were two other stars before us. Now, because of that, those had to be massive stars, right? They had to live and die very quickly because our sun has been around for 5 billion years out of the 13 or 14 billion years of the age of the universe. So there couldn't have, that, that star had to be big so that it could live and die, throw out its ashes, have another star live and die, throw out its ashes so that now our sun is starting to live. And we, right. we gather this from the amount of iron and gold, the, the amount of higher or, or heavier elements gives us a clue on how long we would have had to have been here in order to gather that much stuff. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else have anything they would like to? That was a great presentation, Dr. Hall. I, I, you know, I've, I've seen similar 
stories in different places, but this is, I've always felt there were big gaps left that I, you know, that weren't filled in for me. You filled them all in. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the presentation. So, uh, Dr. Hall, I actually have one more question, if I may. Yeah. Um, on, if you could go back to the slide on the outward flow. I think it was kind of during the stage. If, if you could kind of explain that the bipolar flows, kind of what causes oh. that? Um, whenever you have something that's accreting, right? When you have um, matter flowing in somewhere, right? It, it, it has angular momentum, so it's going to spin. Uh, because of that, it, it's not energetically favorable to try to leave out the disk um, of those. Um, and, and I, I, I don't know that I could go into the, the heavy physics. Oh, no, no, no. It, yeah. is, it, is, it is energetically more favorable not to try to leave along the, uh, the plane of rotation. It is much easier to leave along the poles of the rotation. Okay. Um, and, 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 and I don't know that I know the whole details of that, but, but that is more of a consequence of just the way things rotate. That, that's not really the way anything to do with stars. That's just a generic physical process. If, if I wanted to move away from something and I'm rotating about it, it's easier to go out the plane. It's okay. easier, you know, where the, where, where the plane, you know, the, the accretion disk, it's easier to leave perpendicular to the accretion disk. And, and so that's where those bipolar flows come from. Material as it speeds up, falling in to the star, starts spinning at high rates of speed and basically just spirals out the poles. Okay, I got you. All right. Anything else? If not, I'll turn it back over. Well, thank you. We've had two great presentations. Uh, Joe, uh, really enjoyed your video, and the link has been sent out. And Dr. Hall, thank you very much for your presentation. You. And with that, we'll close out, and we'll see you in December for our annual meeting that most likely will be in this format. So thanks, everybody.